This week's blog post is the third in a, in a walking tour of sculptures in Manhattan's financial district, and it covers Horace Greeley. This 10-part series is based on a walking tour that I offered some years ago. If you go to my website, diandurantiwriter.com, and click New York City Walking Tour in the tag cloud, you'll find others in the series. Or you can just look for the videos on my YouTube channel. Our next stop is a sculpture dedicated in 1890. It's by John Quincy Adams Ward, whose works will appear twice more on this walking tour. You've probably heard Greeley's famous line, Go West, young man, go west. The line was, in fact, first uttered by John Sewell, an editor in, in, in Indiana. But Greeley is the one who made it popular, as a suggestion that Americans should be willing to uproot themselves in order to search for a better life. We certainly heeded that advice. Horace Greeley was born in 1811, just over 200 years ago, on a farm in New Hampshire. He had little formal education, but when at age 14 he was apprenticed to a printer, he discovered that he had a talent for writing. In his early 20s, he moved to New York City. There, when he was 30, he founded a newspaper, the New York Tribune. It was one of a new breed of newspaper. Until the 1830s, most newspapers were sold by annual subscription. What does that imply? A permanent residence and disposable income, enough to pay for a whole year of newspapers. So those newspapers tended to cater to the wealthy. Greeley's Tribune was one of a new sort of paper, a penny paper, which began to appear in New York in the 1830s. Copies of them were sold daily on the street to anyone who wanted to buy. It wasn't until then that there were newsboys standing on street corners shouting, read all about it. Some of the penny papers attracted readers with sensational news, such as murders, scandals, and natural disasters. Who'd have thought such behavior by the media was 200 years old? But the Tribune was different. Greeley aimed to provide all the information an educated man needed to run his life and his business. The Tribune covered politics on the local, national, and international levels. It covered business and culture as well. Of course, this is what newspapers such as the New York Times aim to do today, but Greeley's paper was established 10 years before the New York Times came into being. Although he was even-handed in his news stories, Greeley was very opinionated in his op-eds. He had strong viewpoints on slavery, poverty, and women's rights, as well as capital punishment, tobacco, vegetarianism, and labor rights. In the 1850s, Greeley was a founding member of the Republican Party. During the Civil War, he had tremendous clout with the Lincoln administration because the Tribune supported Lincoln's policies. In 1872, Greeley ran for president against incumbent Ulysses S. Grant. His slogan was, anything to beat Grant. One wonders what his publicists were thinking to choose that. Greeley lost the election and he died within a month. Greeley was a familiar figure to New Yorkers. As the publisher of an important newspaper, he was a media mogul, the first of two that we'll see on this tour. He was often spotted on mass transit reading a newspaper. His presidential bid made his face even more familiar, as did Thomas Nast's, Nast's caricatures of him. This sculpture was unveiled 18 years after Greeley died. Many New Yorkers remembered Greeley just as Ward showed him. He sits relaxed, newspaper in hand, turning slightly. He looks as if he's been interrupted and will shortly go back to work. People said that tilt of the head and interested expression were just how Greeley looked. 19th century businessmen dressed carefully. There were no casual Fridays in the 19th century. Ward, however, captured the oddities and eccentricities of Greeley's personal appearance. Greeley favored comfort over style. His hair straggled. He wore a loose overcoat with a coarse weave. His cravat was usually rather sloppily tied. His waistcoat was pulling at its buttons. Portraits are memorials to help people remember those they knew. This sculpture was so vivid that it helped people remember Greeley. The theme of the sculpture was not Greeley's stance on any one particular issue, but the fact that he was outspoken, forthright, and willing to fight for what he believed in, however unconventional it happened to be. So you might ask, why is a memorial to a media mogul and a failed presidential candidate sitting on the grounds of City Hall Park? Answer, this is not its original location. 
The sculpture was commissioned several years after Greeley died for the facade of the Tribune's new headquarters. The headquarters stood on Printer's Row, near the homes of the New York Herald, the New York Times, the Sun, and the New York World. In times of crisis, before the internet, TV, and radio, people would throng to Printer's Row to get news hot off the presses, which received it by telegraph. The portrait of Greeley made perfect sense in its niche at ground level on the facade of the Tribune bu building. That's it down here. But that building and much of the rest of Printer's Row were eventually torn down to make room for the Brooklyn Bridge's expanded entrance ramps. So Greeley was moved across the street to City Hall Park, where his charmingly eccentric self makes very little sense. Next up on the tour is another work by Frederick McMonnies, one much more inspiring than Civic Virtue. DianeDurantyWriter.com has hundreds of posts on sculpture, painting, Central Park, and my many other obsessions. To join the free Sunday recommendations list, you can visit the URL that's on screen or email me. And you can say, well done, Diane, or support my work and receive rewards by means of the tip jar on DianeDurantyWriter.com. Thanks, as always, for listening.